All right, Luke chapter 22. And um, as we had stated before, uh, we are getting towards the end. And at this point, the Lord is uh, preparing himself for his true um, purpose. And that is the actual payment of sin. Um, the actual payment is about to be done. You know, sometimes you look at certain things that you want to do in, in life. You, I want to go buy a car. Or I want to go buy a, a refrigerator. And you go out and you check it out. And then you actually go in your pocket and get the money out, the cash or, or, the, or the bank card. And you pay for it. And then once you pay for it, there's a transaction where that item now that once belonged to somebody else now belongs to you. And we're going to get to a situation, good morning, to where we'll see that payment made. The Lord is about to make a payment on sin so that those that are in sin no longer belong to the penalty of sin. The Bible says that the, the wages of sin are what? Yeah. But the gift of God is what? Eternal, Eternal life. And so we're going to see that we're, we are at the point now where Jesus is going to make this payment. And this is going to... Um, make it so that we now have no more penalty of sin, but we have uh, the penalty of sin has been taken away or erased. And now what do we have? We have nothing that we earn but a gift that is given unto us, which is the gift of life. And so that is the beautiful aspect of what Jesus is doing. And right now we see the beginnings of that. All right. So. Uh, let's go right into our, our, our reading. Um, chapter 22 has a whole lot of verses. It's got 71 verses in it. So we're going to go through the reading of the entire chapter. Uh, whether we actually um, finish it with the study or not today, uh, I doubt it, but we'll see. We'll see how far we get. All right. So uh, let's move right on into that, and let's, let's listen to our study, Matthew chapter 22. Luke. I'm sorry, Luke chapter 22. Y'all better correct me. Chapter 22. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way, and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised, and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare us the Passover, that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye enter into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he entereth in, and ye shall say unto the good man of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall shew you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. And when the hour was come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. And he said unto them, with desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I will not any more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. And he took bread and gave thanks and brake it and gave it unto them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new testament in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of him that betrayeth me is with me on the table. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it was determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. And there was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. 
but ye shall not be so. But he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief, as he that doth serve. For whether is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat? But I am among you as he that serveth. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appoint unto you a kingdom, as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he said unto them, When I sent you without purse and scrip and shoes, lacked ye anything? And they said, Nothing. Nothing. Then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say unto you, that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And he was reckoned among the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. And he said unto them, It is enough. And he came out and went, and as he went, to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation, he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast, and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer, and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow, and he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them, and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? When they which were about him saw what would follow, they said unto him, Lord! Shall we smite with the sword? And one of them smote the servant of the high priest, and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple, and the elders which were come to him, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour, and the power of darkness. Then they took him, and led him, and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall, and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire, and earnestly looked upon him, and said, This man was also with him. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while another saw him, and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also is with him, for he is a Galilean. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy! Who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us! And he said unto them, If I tell you, ye will not believe. 
And if I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Ye say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. All right. There we go. Chapter 22. Good morning to all. How y'all doing? All right. So we thank God for um, our, our scripture reading on uh, on today. Now we, we we definitely are in some of the um, the depths of this um, this scenario, and we all know the story. We know how how it ends. But I think it's important for us to to keep in mind uh, the lessons and the um, the information that is here for us to not only to just know from history. But how do we apply that? And what do we, what do we actually pull from this, from uh, an aspect of how we handle our business, our relationship with the Lord, our relationship with one another, and our understanding as to what God really did for us. And that helps to appreciate, help us to appreciate it. A lot of times um, you think about what the Lord has done and, and we, you know, you hear about it and you, and you hear people talk about it. And it almost sometimes becomes common, and you just think, of, "All right, well, you know, it's, it's 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 like the air we breathe. It's just, you know, who gets up really every day wondering, wow, I wonder if we're gonna have air today. You know, very seldom do we really have that as a major concern. But the realities of it is, take the air away. <laughs> All of a sudden, we have a universal crisis. It's the same thing with salvation." When Jesus went and he did what he what he's about to do, we're about to read. We hear about it and it's almost common and it's nothing new, but you take that away, and um, um, I think it was Paul said that if we didn't have this greater salvation, we would be of all men most what miserable. It would be a miserable existence not having this. So, um, so therefore, we're going to kind of look at it from from that standpoint. It's not just being something that we know from you know from history and whatever but really try to understand what it really accomplished and what benefits we actually did truly gain from that. All right? Um, and some people say, yeah, well, I get eternal life. And that's true, too. Um, but we will also want to make sure that we don't take that lightly. So let's start at the beginning. Chapter 22, verse 1. It says, And now the feast of the unleavened uh, bread drew nigh, which is called what? Passover. All right. Now, and that... Uh, Jewish community and even today they celebrate Passover now the Passover for them was a, a celebration or a, 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 a remembrance of the uh, the exile out of Egypt remember the story of Moses and when they had the ten plagues and then the final plague was the death of the what the firstborn child but then they told them that if you bring in a lamb a, a lamb that was without spot, and you kill the lamb, and then you eat the, the flesh of the lamb, and you take the blood of the lamb, and you sprinkle it along the doorpost of the dwelling that you lived in. When that angel came in to kill the firstborn of all the people on that land, it would it would uh, pass over you. That's what the, you get the, from the term Passover. So when you look at that, and it's almost sometimes difficult for uh, anyone that knows the story of Christ and then understands the Jewish tradition of Passover how they don't actually see the connection but they don't they don't get it because Jesus is our what our lamb and when they when Moses's time had to kill the sacrificial lamb this already was a precursor or a a shadowing a showing of how not just Israel was going to be delivered from Egypt, but how humanity was going to be delivered from sin, which is why in, our, in, in the Bible, typology, Egypt is a type of sin. And so God's people, Israel, was delivered from Egypt, which was a type of sin, through the death of the lamb and the eating of his body and the sprinkling of his, of his blood on the doorpost. Well, how are we saved? We saved because of the the, the death of God's perfect lamb, who is who? Jesus. 
And it's, it's, it's so uh, simplistic in its uh, analogy, but most of your so-called Orthodox Jewish people don't, don't see that. They don't get it. And even in some of their, their traditions, even today, that they have, when they celebrate it today, they will get uh, unleavened bread, and that's sinless bread, right? Bread with no leaven in it. I call this, you know, the matzah bread. And they would get three of them. So you have three pieces of matzah bread, which represents three un, uh, pieces of unleavened bread, which I find it interesting because the Father is what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then they would take the three and lay it aside, lay, lay them together. Then the one in the middle, they will take that matzah bread and they'll wrap it in a napkin. And then they'll break it and then hide it. All right? Which I find interesting because they, they took... Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit, but the one in the middle, which was rep would be representative of what? The Son. And they take it and they break it and wrap it in a napkin and hide it. And then they bring it out after a period of time. So what happened to Jesus? His body was what? Broken. Broken. All right. And then he was what? Buried. Buried. And then he did what? He came back. So the symbol, the the the, the, the uh, uh, symbol uh, in the uh, exercising of the Passover, even today, still coincides. It speaks very loudly to those who want to hear it. Um, that Jesus is the Messiah, but yet they're still looking for the Messiah. Yes, sir. I have a question. Didn't they uh, have unleavened bread because they had no time to let the bread rise? They had it told to just prepare the bread quickly. Exactly. Yep, that's exactly uh, what they were told to do. They said not to put any any in there, and that was what they were told during the during the time of um, uh, of, of their preparation to move out of Egypt. But that doesn't take away the symbol. The the the, the, uh, the yeah. what word am I trying to find? Symbolism. Symbolism. Thank you. <laughs> well, that symbolizes we have to quickly leave our ways of sin mm -hmm. and just go to righteousness. Exactly. And so it, it's, it's a beautiful example. It really is. And yet, uh, a lot of times, people don't recognize it. So um, just right from the beginning here, you see that now Jesus is, is recognizing, okay, the Passover is drawing nigh. Now look at verse 2. And the chief priests and the scribes sought how they might do what? Kill him. Now, they're, they're still not putting two and two together here because their focus is on Jesus is taking away our control and our power. All right, and so they, that's why they want to kill him. But it's odd because really during Passover, what are you supposed to look to do? Kill the lamb. You see that? And so they're looking to what? Kill the lamb. They're seeking to kill the lamb. All right. Uh, and at the end of that, it says, but they feared the people. They couldn't do it because they feared the people. And that also speaks to their mentality they were, their whole view of anything they did was, how can I be lifted up in the eyes of the people? I want the people to look at me and go, wow, look at this guy. Wow, look at them. They are something else. They always wanted to be admired by other folk. What, what spirit is that? The devil. Because the devil always says, I'm going to lift my throne. I'm going to be like the most high. The devil wants to be worshipped. He wants to be admired. And our society, unfortunately, is taking on a lot of that. And in, unfortunately, even in our, 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 our places of worship, that's becoming more and more of a place for celebrity and not for uh, serenity and study and, 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 and wholesome teaching, unfortunately. And we're going to see this even as we go through this chapter, as we get uh, further in it. We'll, we'll visit that again. But in verse 3, it says, Then entered what? Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. In other words, he was one of the what? Twelve. One of the twelve, the, or the apostles, right? And uh, verse 4. Actually, before we go to verse 4, let me just say this. Uh, somebody says, well, how, if, if Judas is following Jesus... How could Satan get into him? And I think it's important for us to recognize that being familiar with the Bible, knowing the name and, and all the aspects and, 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 and even going to a, a Bible study or to a church, or, 
that doesn't make you a Christian. What makes you a Christian is being saved. Now, being saved doesn't also mean that if you say you're saved, I'm, I'm saved because I believe in Jesus. That doesn't make you saved either. What makes you saved is when you truly in your heart and mind, your whole being have said, Jesus is my Messiah. He's my God. He's my Lord. He's my Savior. And you transform your whole thinking to accept that. Now, we're going to see here the difference between two people. We see Judas, who was a follower of Jesus, and Peter, who was a follower of Jesus. Every one of the disciples are going to forsake Jesus. It wasn't just Peter. And, and Judas was not the only one that had issues. All of them had issues. But there was a distinct difference between what the other apostles did and what Judas did. And we're going to point that out. Uh, when we get to the point where, where uh, Jesus talks to Peter. All right. But I think it's important to recognize that just by association does not make you uh, protected. So Judas had a problem. And his problem was that he was more focused on what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it, than on understanding who Jesus was and hearing what Jesus was saying. In other words, when you decide, I don't want to hear the Holy Spirit, when you, what, grieve the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit is trying to convict you to, to, to do certain things and you just like, I don't, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. I don't care about what the Spirit of God is trying to speak to me. The Bible says then that there is no more hope for you. That if you don't hear the Spirit of God trying to tell you a certain aspect of truth, because the only thing the Spirit of God is going to convey to you is that Jesus is the way and you should follow him. Judas was trying to get Jesus to follow him, which is not going to happen. And therefore, now, if you're out in the lead, but we'll see here in a minute that he wasn't the only one kind of out there, although he was the, the only one that Satan entered into. Verse uh, 4, and he went his way uh, and communed with the chief priests and the captains, how he might betray him unto them. All right, I'm going to read the rest of this here. And they were glad and covenant to give him what? money. Now we know that the Bible says that Judas was a thief. Alright? So, right off the bat, one of Judas's greeds was satisfied. Judas wanted money. We know he wanted money because he was stealing. We'll, we'll see that even more so when we get into the book of John that he was stealing out of the treasury. And then we also know that Judas was the one, remember the alabaster box that was broken? And, and then one of the disciples said, why didn't we sell that to give the money to the poor? That was Judas that said that. Well, Judas' concern was not the poor. Judas knew that if we had sold that, put the money in the treasury, they'd give me more money to pilfer from. The more money I got in the treasury, the more money I can, I can manipulate and, and, and work with. So his, 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 his focus was a lot of greed. All right. Verse 6, it says, And he, he promised and sought an opportunity to betray him unto them uh, in the absence of the multitude. All right. Well, once again, they want to do this outside of the visibility of people because the people saw Jesus as a what? As a, as some saw him as a great worker. Some saw him as a, as a great teacher. Some saw him as the Messiah. But all the people saw him in some kind of positive light. But not all of them saw him in the proper positive light. It's the same problem we got today. There's a lot of people that see Jesus as a great man. They see him as a good teacher. They'll see him as a, as a, as a great prophet. That's what the, um, the Muslims say. Jesus, is, he was a great prophet. That ain't it. That ain't going to cut it. If you see Jesus as a great prophet, you missed the boat, man. You, you missed it. Because if he's not your Messiah, if he's not your Savior, you're not saved. It has to be Savior. You've got to see him as God. And that's the problem that we have in today. Everyone's trying to homogenize uh, all these things together so that Buddha and Muhammad and Jesus and all these folks are all the same. Yes, sir? That's what the religious leaders have a problem with. Because, uh -huh. you know, they say, well, you're making yourself equal with God. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's when they have their problem with Yeah, well, and actually we're going to see that uh, as well here, uh, depending on how far we get into this. All right. Um, so, um, now they were happy, and then the Judas and the, and the Pharisees um, kind of got themselves together. Uh, There's an old saying, birds of a feather flock together. 
there was no reason in, in the world why we could not think that somehow or another the Pharisees and Judas would end up on the same street. Look at the people you hanging with. Did you, you, you know, did you around? Look at look at your 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 your, your partners, your buddies, your friends, your boys, your homies, your girls. Check them out, cause that's you. That's who you. That's who you are. Now, some people say, "Well, I, you know, I ain't I ain't got a whole lot of partners." Well, there ain't nothing wrong with that. You know, so, you know, sometimes when you out there, you know, say, I got one or two people that I'm really like tight with, and and that's not a bad thing. Some people make you try to make you feel bad because you ain't got a dozen friends. Well, here's Jesus, who was God come to earth, and he had really 11 people that was in his corner. Out of the, the millions of people on the earth, <laughs> bless you, he had 11 people. But then when things got really tight, he was by himself. Right? And so don't feel bad. <laughs> don't feel bad at all. You know, when things get really tight, guess who you're going to have to count on? The Lord. You're going to have to count on the Lord. Because your partners, your buddies, your girlfriends, they might not be able to be found. All right. So verse 7 says, It came uh, the day of unleavened bread when the Passover uh, must be killed. Now keep this in mind. Um, on the day that the Passover must be killed, this is also the day that Jesus is going to die. But remember how they counted their day. The Jewish people counted their day from, from, sun, from sundown to what? Sunrise. So by the time of the, the, the next uh, uh, day, Jesus will have been uh, crucified. So he's going to be killed on the Passover day. I have a question. Mm -hmm. they count, when, when did they start there? I was like, from sunrise would be the first watch. There's four watches in a day. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. Um, did they say he died the sixth hour? Or how did that work? Exactly what time did he die? Well, your, your first hour, your, 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 your first watch would be a six hour period from six no from six e six in the evening because the day would begin at six in the evening from six in the evening to tw to twelve at night that's the first six hour and then from uh from twelve at night to six morning will be your second watch and then from six in the morning to twelve in the afternoon will be your third watch and then from twelve noon to six in the evening will be your final watch and that's the watch that he died in Follow me. All right. Because he died ab about the third hour, which would probably be about three o'clock. You know how we would look at it. Around that time. All right. Um, but all I'm giving you is what I see here. You know, I wasn't there. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, but 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 it's but it's sometimes it's good to know the yeah the habit. All right. So look at verse 8. It says, And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go prepare us the Passover that we may eat. All right. And uh, they said unto him, Where wilt uh, thou that we prepare? And then he gives them this whole story here. He says, He said unto them, Behold, you will enter into a city, and there a man you will meet, and he will be bring, bearing a, a pitcher of water. Follow him. Uh, into the house that he enters into and then you shall say unto the, the good man of that house uh, the master saith unto thee where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples and uh, he will show you a large upper room uh, furnished uh, there make ready and of course in verse 13 it says and they went and found uh, as he had said unto them and they uh, made ready the Passover so I mean, that's pretty simplistic there. We see that there is a situation where, however, this good man of the house knew what to do when someone came to him and said it. Who knows? Some people say, well, there's no reason to assume that this man had some kind of miraculous dream or something. They say, well, probably Jesus went by there maybe the year before and talked to the man. I, when they say that, I, I'm like, well, that's a possibility. But the reality of it is we, I don't know. I mean, God could have gave the man a dream. Jesus could have talked to him a year ago. Jesus could have talked to him five years ago. Who knows? I mean, the Holy Spirit could have just spoke to the man's heart. However, the man, when, when the disciples came to Jesus, I mean, when the disciples came to that good man in the house, and they said what Jesus told them to say, that man knew exactly what to do. And he had everything ready. And that's important, too. Because when the Lord tells you and speaks to your heart, when, when God speaks to us, we should be ready and obedient to do it. 
because there's a purpose for it. You know, I'm sure this man's thinking, hey, he want me to get this furniture set up and everything. Not knowing, maybe, possibly, that he was preparing and, and assisting in the, the uh, uh, preparation for the payment of the sins of the world. How important is what you're doing? Sometimes you don't think it's, well, I'm, what I'm doing is not that important. You don't know how important it is. You don't know how many people are going to be blessed because of your walk with the Lord and your obedience to God. You really don't know. You think it's not that significant. I'm sure this man thought, hey, man, no big deal. I mean, your man wants a, wants a room with a couple chairs, a table. All right, no big deal. He probably put it in his, in his, you know, in his order and just said, okay, this is what we, oh, oh, yeah, that's right, today's that day. Okay, yep, yep, it's up there, it's all set. And went on about his business. But look at how significant it was. All right, because that's where Jesus and his disciples had the Last Supper. All right, so um, we come down now to um, verse 14. It says, and when the hour was come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. Verse 15, and he said unto them, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Now, he continues to give hints about this suffering. And remember the thinking of the, of the, the apostles was that the Messiah was coming not to suffer, but to do what? To conquer, to set up his what? His kingdom. But he keeps telling them, I've come to suffer and to die. All right? And he keeps putting that in there, but they, they still haven't got it yet. Verse 16. For I say unto you, I will no more eat thereof until it be fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So he's saying this is going to be the last time I eat. The next time I have a meal like this, it will be in the kingdom of God. All right. And verse uh, 17 says, And he took the cup, and he gave thanks, and said, Take this, and divide it amongst yourselves. Verse 18, For I say unto you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God shall come. All right? So this is the last uh, 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 drink of this, of this wine or this fruit of, the, fruit of the vine that he's going to have until we drink it with him in the kingdom. All right? So he's, he's waiting for that uh, even now. We're waiting for that. But then he tells us uh, in verse 19, it says, And he took the bread and gave thanks and break it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, once again, he's talking about his body as a symbol, which even goes back as what we talked about the, uh, the unleavened bread being broken. He took the bread and he did what? He broke it. All right? And he explained that this is, he's telling us to this day, the reason why y'all break the bread is because what? It represents my what? My body. He makes it as plain as, 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 as can be. Because just how my body was broken, that's why this bread was broken. All right? Um, and verse uh, uh, 20, it says, Likewise also the cup after uh, supper, saying, This cup is the what? The new what? The new what? New Testament or new covenant. So basically, what is he saying? He's saying the, the Jewish people were following what covenant? The what? The Mosaic covenant. All right. But Jesus is saying now that this Passover, which once was following the Mosaic tradition, now Passover will follow a new tradition, the, tra the tradition of what? My death and burial and resurrection, the new covenant. All right. So he's saying that there's nothing really that's going to change about it. There's still the bread. There's still the, the, uh, the wine or the drink. But the, the, the meaning behind it no longer is to just celebrate your coming out of Egypt. But it's now going to celebrate your coming out of sin. All right? And that's important. And Jesus recognizes that. But, I mean, and we see it now. But you've got to keep in mind the disciples at that time, they were, they were like, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, whatever. They, they just didn't get it until 
they, they begin to look back. And when we get into the book of Acts, you see then how they look back. And man, boy, it sure did. They got powerful then. How many things in your life that when you were going through it, you went through it and you was like, yeah, whatever. But then you look back on it and you go, that was a major turning point. That was a major thing in my life. And I was kind of like, whatever. You know, it was no big deal. But you look back on it now as being a little bit more wiser, a little bit more mature. You know, you understand how significant some of those little decisions you made when you were younger really did impact your, your life today. Well, even the disciples, they're sitting here, very immature spiritually. They don't get it. Jesus is explaining it to them. And I don't blame them. You know why I don't blame them? Because I probably would have been in the same situation. You know, we probably, you know, you, you can't really, you know, we look at it in hindsight and we almost want to scold them and say, how come y'all didn't understand? Put us back there with the same uh, access to information that they had. We probably would have been in the same boat. But thank God that they, they truly, and this is going to be the difference between Judas and the rest of them, they never stopped believing Jesus as being the Messiah. Even though they didn't understand the true definition as to what the coming of the Messiah at this point meant, they never stopped believing he was the Messiah. All right. So when Judas was beginning to betray Jesus, he was betraying him thinking, well, the Messiah is definitely going to come, he's going to set up the kingdom, I'm going to basically force his hand I'm going to make him, I'm going to let him get arrested. And then that's going to prove to, to everybody that he's the Messiah because he's not going to let them arrest him because he's coming to do what? Set up the king. And so Judas was like, well, he didn't do that. And since he didn't do it, maybe he's not the Messiah. And Judas's confusion caused him to do what? Kill himself. Don't, don't, don't go crazy over, over confusion. Go to God. Go to the Lord. And he did not believe Jesus as being the Messiah. And when you don't believe Jesus is the Messiah, whether you live a thousand years or you live two years, you know, it don't matter how long you live once you come to that point. Once you know Jesus is your Messiah, then you, you, you're, you're locked in. You know it. As long as you hold on to that with all your heart and you don't vacillate and turn back and forth. The Bible talks about a double-minded double man is what? Image. Uh, is unstable in all his ways and you can't be like that and Judas was very unstable very unstable and, and um, there's a lot of things in life that can make you unstable you can be unstable about the economy I don't know which way to go mm -hmm. I mean or we could be unstable about a job that you got I don't know whether I should put more emphasis in working here or look for another job. You could be unstable about family members. I don't know about this person. Should we help this one? Should we do that? You can be a little, because that's life. But you cannot be wishy-washy and unstable about who Jesus is. You have to just say, you know, you, that's why the Bible says without faith it's impossible. You just got to say to yourself, he's, he's the Messiah. He's the Messiah. I'm, I'm, you know, and just stand on that. I may not be able to explain it all, but he's the Messiah. Well, how come this? I don't know. I'm not God. I don't know everything. But I tell you what, all I know is Jesus is my Savior. And hang on to that. In the midst of all the confusion and all the other stuff that comes along, that's where your strength is going to come from. That's where your, your, your ability to, to not be able to be tricked by the devil is going to come from. Whereas Judas was tricked and the other disciples were uh, they faltered in following Jesus. They never faltered in knowing who Jesus was. See, sometimes your, your, your walk with Jesus may be bumpy and rocky, and you may stumble along the way, but it never stops you from knowing who Jesus is. And I think that's important to keep in mind. All right? And so Jesus is going gonna, gonna to check out a couple of things here. And I think this is a very important part here because he's actually going to tell them, it's almost like he's saying, guys, you still don't get it. But, but let, me, let me read it here. Um, verse 22. He says, But be, behold, uh, the hand of him that betrayeth me is what with me on the table. Verse 22. And truly the Son of Man goeth as it is determined. But woe unto that man by whom he is betrayed. All right, so Jesus is saying, it is, it is, it is um, foretold, and there is a person that is going to come and that is going to betray me. 
But woe unto that person that's going to do that. Because that means you let yourself go to a point that where Satan can enter you and capitalize on your confusion. All right? But look at what happens after Jesus says that. Look at verse 23. And they began to inquire amongst themselves. Who's the they? The they is the what? The apostles, right? They began to inquire amongst themselves which of them it was that should do this thing. Do what thing? Betray him. All right? So they're, they're, they're looking. You know, we look over here. Who was it? You know, who did it? Who, who's going to do this? And they're arguing amongst themselves who it is that has done this thing. All right? Doesn't stop there, though. Look at what the next verse says. Verse 24. And there uh, was also a strife among them, which of them should be accounted the greatest. Now, Jesus is trying to explain to them his suffering and his death. He just talked about the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood. And they, and then he tells them that some one of them is going to betray them. And then that leads them into a discussion over who it is that's going to betray. And then you can easily see how that conversation would shift to who's the greatest. Because, see, we when we say, if, so, if somebody says, oh, somebody here is going to betray Jesus. And we were like, whoa. And, uh, I, think, I think it's going to be him. Well, and then he'd be like, no, it ain't going to be me. It's going to be him. And, uh, and he'd be like, no, nah, man, I love Jesus more than you do. No. And so you get into that, that's how you get to who's the greatest. How could you love Jesus more than you the one that fell when you walked in the water? You know, so, so you know you get to all this finger pointing, and the next thing you know, what are you doing? Strife. Strife. And in order to build up the denial that it's not you, you then begin to do similar things that Judas and Satan does, and that's what I'm gonna lift myself up. I'm greater. I'm better than you. That's why I know I'm not the one to portray it. I'm better than you. Matter of fact, I'm better than all of y'all. So it's not me. But that's when you know that that's why it just might be you. Because, see, that's the problem that Satan has. When Satan looks and sees that he's better than everybody else, it makes him feel good. You don't want that spirit. But look at what Jesus does. Jesus capitalizes right on it. He jumps right on this. Verse 25. And he said unto them, he said, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. All right. Jesus, he, first of all, he points out a couple of things. He's, he sees them arguing about who's going to be the greatest. And he's, he jumps in. He says, you know what, guys? The kings of the Gentiles, they exercise lordship. Now, what that means is that they put themselves in a place of, of rule and authority. And then they command them to hit their subjects to do certain things and they manipulate and control the lives of their subjects so that if if, if uh, brother Abe is set up as the authority then brother Abe says oh, I'm sorry Gabe <laughs> I'm renaming him and everything <laughs> Brother Gabe is uh, set up as uh, the authority, and he says, bro, go down the street and get me a cup of coffee, and then you got to go do it. He says, he says I, I, I want you to cook me some, you know, this, and I want you to sew me some clothes, uh, and, and he sits up, you know, and just receives it all, <laughs> all right? And that's how it does, and you sit in his high chair, and everybody else caters around him. Ain't it good that we don't have that going on today, right? <laughs> it happens, don't it? You see it. And I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you, I saw, when I saw, I saw a guy that was, that was, uh, he was teaching. And it's bad enough now sometimes they can't even carry their own Bible. Um, but then when the guy got up, somebody else got up and started wiping his face while he was teaching. Now, this is, this is me. Maybe I got an issue. But I was like, I'm sorry. I, I can wipe my own face. If, I, if I'm you know, beginning to perspire, I can get my own handkerchief and wipe my own face. 
Why he gotta have three people standing around waiting to catch the sweat before the That's holy sweat. That's dope. That's holy sweat, son. That's holy sweat. I, 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 I don't know. That's holy sweat, man. You don't know because you're not dope like that. I guess I'm not. <laughs> I don't think I wanna be. But it bothered me. I didn't really you know, sometimes you get to the point where you don't say a whole lot, yeah. but you just be like, that don't, that don't sit well with my spirit. And and it just doesn't. And they, you get to the point to where everybody's got to now cater to this. And we got to bring him his juice, and he's got his tea, and his everything. And he, and he can't do anything. And he's set up as this law. And Jesus is, but look at what Jesus says about this. Let's read this all the way through now. I'm going to start back at the 25th, chapter, 25th verse. And he said unto, uh, unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority uh, upon them are called benefactors. Verse, verse uh, 26. But ye shall not be so. Did I read that correct? But ye, his, uh, his apostles, his disciples, shall not be so. In other words, don't do that. Don't set yourself up like that where everybody else is catering to you. Well, if I don't set myself up where everybody's catering to me, what should I do? Well, let's find out. But, but he that is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger. And he that is chief as he that does what? Serve. Oh, 27. For whether is greater, he that uh, sitteth at meat or he that serves, is not he that sitteth at meat, but I am among you. This is Jesus saying. He said, I am among you as he that what? Serves. Who's the greatest in that room? Jesus, without, without question. But what is Jesus doing? Who broke the bread? Who poured the wine? Who passed around the cup? Who passed around the bread? Who girded the feet to himself? Who washed their feet? Jesus did all that. So we got it backwards. When you really, really feel that, that, that God has blessed you, you should look to serve. And so you wonder sometimes, you know, you look at people that are, are not doing well, and people in halfway houses, and people in homeless shelters. People that really think that, that God has blessed them, that's where they should go. You know, we, we should be at a point where we can find people that maybe are not doing as well as we are and serve them, help them. That's the whole, that's, that's the gospel in a nutshell. And not put yourself up, put on a $500 suit, and I ain't got nothing against suits. If you got a $500 suit, I ain't, I ain't telling you to sell your suit. I mean, but the problem is that when, when that's it, you know, how good can I look, what kind of you know, I got to have the right kind of car and the right suit. And I want to walk down the street and people be like, oh, yeah, that's so-and-so. That's so-and-so. That's backwards. And, and after a while, you get to the point to where you kind of think you, you go along with it. But you know what? That's one of the things that, that, that made me have to stop associating with because I can't be hypocritical to myself. I can't assign and ascribe to something that when I read in the Bible, I say, Jesus tells us not to do this. He tells us time and time and time again, and we got it backwards. I said, unfortunately, the society of the scribes and Pharisees has not died. It's still alive. That spirit is still here. And it's still with the same kind of people, the religious leaders. And it's, it's a sad thing, and, I, and I'm not against nobody. I just have to be true to myself. I got a lot of, a lot of friends that do the stuff I'm just talking about. And I call them friend. And I t but I tell them straight up, <laughs> man, I don't know why you do all that. You know? It, it, but that's just, you know, but you got to be honest with people. And I can't do it anymore I, to be true to myself. We got to be right with God, and God's word tells us that we have to follow uh, the teachings of Jesus. And Jesus clearly says we shouldn't do certain things. And why do we do that? Because we get into a rut of behavior and it's tradition and and it's it's very uh, self-evident in a wrong way 
and you can you can def you can defend it incorrectly because I can say, look at how I'm blessed. Well, how do you know I'm blessed? Look at my bank account. That's how I know I'm blessed. And people will be like, oh, okay. I mean, that's you know kind of kind of simple in their thinking, but in reality, Jesus says that's not true. That's not how you can tell. Because he talked about the man that had the big barns, and he says, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a man's worth is not uh, 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 built up by the abundance of the things that he possesses. It's your heart. Now, when you start comparing yourself to other people, and in the eyes of people, and that's all the Pharisees cared about was how the people saw them, then you need that fly car. You need that fire hunt. If I want people to be impressed with what, if I want people to say, you know what, I want to know what, what uh, I want, I want what they're doing. If I wanted to put forth an image, then I got to get that nice, nice car. Got to have that nice suit. Got to have the right shoes. And they look at me and like, man, how did he get to all that? You don't know I got nine mortgages on my house just to look good, <laughs> just to impress you. But that ain't right. You know, so why don't we try to just be obedient and stop trying to impress? That's the simple thing. And watch God bless. You know, and God's gonna bless. Now, see, the problem is understand and make sure you properly define God's blessing. It's not because you got a fat bank account. Or, or, or what's, what's that? What's that real expensive car? That real expensive, you know, that 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 Mercedes. The Bentley. The Bentley. Yeah, you ain't you, just because you you know you may not be driving the Bentley. Or the Lexus, you know, you know, those, 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 those some, you know, those sixty thousand dollar cars, whatever. But uh, you know, but but once again, if God has blessed you with money, there's nothing wrong with driving that. You see the point? I'm not saying that those things are wrong. There's nothing wrong with a five hundred dollar suit. There's nothing wrong with a Mercedes, a Bentley. There's nothing wrong with those things in, in themselves. This, if, if God has blessed you with a nice, you know, uh, income and you want it, go get it. Right. But at the same time, understand that that's not your God's favor on you. God's favor on you is how you relate to people, especially people that don't have what you have. That's God's blessings and God's favor. All right. All right. We got five minutes. Let's see how far we're going to get here. All right. Verse 28. It said, he says, ye are they which have uh, continued with me. Uh, in my temptation. All right. Uh, verse 29. And I appoint unto you a kingdom as my father hath appointed unto me. So look at what Jesus is saying. He's saying you continue with me um, in my uh, temptation. In other words, he recognizes that uh, they are with him and he has had a lot of strife. And even when he's arrested, he's going to point that out. He's going to say, I was with you guys daily. Why do you wait to now to come and arrest me? So he's saying to us to his apostles, you guys are with me. And he says, and I appoint you certain places. Verse 30, uh, that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So he's letting them know that the, the works that you did don't gain you salvation. What gained you salvation was is, is me dying. But the works that you did will gain you position. And that's important to keep in mind, too. Because sometimes people think, oh, I don't have to do any changing. Or I don't have to improve my life. Or I don't have to. No, you should. Because that will give you not so much the possession of salvation. The possession of salvation comes from the gift of God. But your position, you know, it's like the, the man that, that, um, that he gave the talents to. All right? The one that actually used his talent actually gained what? More talent. All right. So your your obedience to God will have some bearing, and I don't know how much or what, but some bearing on what your role in eternity will be. All right. And it's important to keep that in mind. All right. You said no. You gonna sit with Grandpa? Come on. And so it's important to keep that in mind. And as we as as we finish this up, we got just um, two more minutes here, and we're gonna finish this up. You want to eat my cookie? Okay, you can have it. All right. Last verse here. Then we'll pick this up again on on next week. Um, and we're just gonna step into this. 
verse 30, uh, verse 31. And the Lord said unto Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as what? As wheat. Now, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that Satan doesn't just want Peter. Guess who else he wants? Every one of us. He wants us all. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. And so he wants all of us. And uh, we're going to stop there. And we'll pick this up on next week. But keep this in mind. The fact that Satan went and petitioned God. Let me get this brother and let me just spin him around and bash on him like you would bash on wheat to get the, 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 the kernels out. I want to tear his life up. Let me do it. And Jesus said, and we're going to stop here. He said, he said, Simon, verse 31, Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. 32, but I have prayed for thee, that your what? Faith, Faith fail not. All right? And we're going to stop, stop there. He didn't pray that he didn't get tempted. He didn't pray that he didn't get sifted. He prayed that his what? His faith doesn't fail. Folks, we're going to go through stuff that's going to make us heartbroken and, and tears drop and all that. But the main thing that God says, that if you hang on to your faith, you'll make it. You got to keep in your heart and in your mind that I am your God and your Messiah. You may be slack and how you follow me, but never, never disregard who I am. And as long as you do that, you'll continue to maneuver and to, and to grow. You'll have your ups and downs, but you'll continue to grow. You'll continue to grow in the Lord. People's vision of how you grow is never really coincides to how God sees you. And remember that. It's not what people see or how people define you. It's how God defines you. All right? And what did God say to Job when Satan went to, to, to God about Job? Uh, actually, Satan went, went to, to God uh, uh, and, and God asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm going to and fro, seeking who I may devour, who I might sift. And then what did God say? Have you considered my servant, Job? You see that? So, and, and, but, but the devil was like, his answer was like, yeah, I considered him. And I, ain't, I can't get to him because you got a hedge of protection around him. And I can't get to him. He said, but if you remove that hedge, I'll make Job curse you to your face. And it, but God knew what was in Job. Job's faith was never going to fail. And that's a, it's a good uh, uh, illustration to show how you can go through major problems and question a lot of stuff, but never question who God is. You might question what God's doing, how can he let this happen? And I'm not saying that that's not something that you can, you can do. You can do that. But you never question who God is. You always know who the Lord is. Right? <laughs> All right. So we're going to stop there. We'll pick up on the remaining part of that.